I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Okay, can you hear me back there? Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, this is a sort of a, a weird talk. Um, uh, this for me, no, the, my future disappeared. So that's this uh, So maybe this is a sense of, in a sense, my vision of the future. Um, it's quite hard to do a visionary talk because, on one hand, when you know you're wrong because you have no clue what's going on, uh, and that's just of the future. And uh, the advantage point from a speaker is that you also don't have an idea of what's going on, so and what is the future then. So, in that sense, I think it will be interesting in 20 years' time to look at this uh, slide and see how wrong I was. Um, so my talk will essentially focus on three things. Uh, so we have very connected talks because I also have a suggestion of Shakespeare. So it's quite interesting because we didn't have all communicated before. Uh, so the first part of my talk will be on data diligence and learning of stream, and on the fact that you have so much data uh, in certain fields of biology that it's starting to get difficult to cope with. Uh, then I will move on to say that bioinformatics is very often biology. It's not different from biology. Uh, and the last part of my talk will be dedicated to the fact that bioinformatics is dying, and in 10 years time, it will be quite varied, the same way as medical biology is being varied. <laughs> so where do I stand in this, in this thing? So you can sort of um, look at any scientific field as a, something that pertains to three types of, of, of uh, activities. Uh, experiments, which typically involve handling, handling reality in certain controlled ways. Uh, data analysis and theory. And I, I typically tend to stay on this part of the graph. Uh, so I do data analysis, I use the of this theory. And of course, all, all this has to be intimately connected with the experimental side, because uh, that's where the data comes from. And my argument is that, in fact, every biologist is, in a sense, a data analyst, at the very least, with some averages and some data set. Uh, and in a sense, a theoretical biologist, because we all have in biology a number of theories, a number of models that we use, sometimes very implicitly, uh, that they're there. So typically, I get in this part of the graph. Um, and my, 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 my claim here is that in the future, this part of the graph will be more important than it is today, and what it used to be in biology. And this is because uh, theoretical biology, it, it's becoming a very, very important part of this process of trying to handle the data delusion. The fact that we have so much data that we need to make sense of it in a more formal way than we used to. So theory, this comes from the National Academy of Science report a few years ago on theory in biology. And basically, this is an interesting report you can download it for free on the internet. And basically, what it says is that we all are doing theoretical biology in a sense. And this theoretical biology can be, for certain people, very complicated systems of differential equations. And for certain people, it can just be some drawings. You cut more drawings, you draw narrow. And this is, in a sense, a model. Of course, it might, these different types of models can help you in different ways to handle the amount of data there is up there, but they're all useful in some way. They all represent certain type, certain abstract description of your system that will allow you to move forward your questions in biological research and to answer them. So, um, the, the really issue in theory, and that's why we typically do not think so much about theoretical biology, is that most of these models do not correspond to the stereotypes that we used to when you're thinking, for instance, in theoretical physics or even in theoretical chemistry. Things in biology, tend to, models in biology, tend to be less formal. And, and that, of course, is a problem. Now, I also lost a part of the slide. This is quite clear. Um, okay. So this basically has four papers here. Uh, to try to demonstrate that, um, if I can change the resolution, um, well, it worked in my lab. Um, so basically, these are four papers which show that the tradition of theoretical biology is, in fact, a long tradition. So the first paper here uh, was a paper by Robert May in the 70s, where he showed how complex system ecological systems can be, even when we start from relatively simple differential equations. It's a totally dry paper in the sense that there wasn't much data about it, about the models or the formulas, and it wasn't interesting and sort of inexpected. 
second paper is by Moto Kimura, it's a fairly well-known paper, it's paper that started the natural evolution theory, and it was much more grounded than what's found on the theoretical and mathematical models. Now the two other papers were less grounded on mathematical models. The first one is Moto Kimura, Jean Jean-Jo and Jack Paul paper called Elastomy. There are some formulas there, but you can see that it's more uh, it's a less formal part of and the last paper, which is the most important in a sense, is the Watson and Crick's paper in nature in 1921, which is a paper which has a model, and the model is just a drawing. There is nothing more in the paper. It's a very short paper, and essentially the model is a drawing. And it's probably the most influential model in biology, at least in the 20th century. So, the theoretical approaches allow us to search the data because they sort of guide us. They allow us to express in mathematical or in graphical terms what are the expectations that we have. And this allows us to draw all the data that's out there and see how the expectations are fitting the data. <coughs> and this is, I think, something that will be extremely important in, in the next few years. It's how we manage to handle data and to produce data that can be handled by other people. So this graph is already in German, more or less the same. Um, it's essentially uh, how many data, how many nucleotide sequences have been deposited in the genome database on the world since they were created in the early 80s until uh, 2013. Now the first method of sequencing, it was Sanger sequencing, it's in, in blue. It, 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 it allowed a vast expansion of the database and sequencing. You can see it's an exponential expansion for many years. Uh, but things rapidly have started to, to accelerate recently with the introduction of new methods of sequencing. And if you look at the new so-called next generation sequencing, which has been now around for a certain time, so probably should call it the last generation sequencing methods, uh, they, have they are still allowing a growth of data that is exponential, but the slope is much harder. And what this means is that basically the amount of genetic information available in the data banks is doubling now every nine months. When you used to that work about every 18 months. And this has very important consequences. First, it means that, and this is the good news, that many people are doing the work for you. This data is being produced, often the capacity is free. People are just sequencing this stuff. They have all these machines, they have all this money, they just sequence. And so if you can use this data, you really have a net because you don't have to bother with this. Now the second graph, which is sort of too close to your graph, it's how costly it is to sequence. So in 2000, the sequence, one megabase of DNA sequencing cost almost $10,000. This is the reason, so I, I, I highlight that my scales are typically what okay? uh, So this started to decrease very quickly until 2007, and then it got even worse. And now to sequence one megabase of information it costs you about 10 cents. So what this tells you is that sequencing is no longer a problem. For many of the problems in biology that you would like to tackle with sequencing, very often the problem and the cost is no longer the sequencing part. I work in macro genomes. They're so cheap that sometimes we're embarrassed by how many genomes we have. <laughs> so that's no longer a problem. But in a sense, this gives you a false impression of how costly this kind of information is. Because, you see, as time goes by and that sequencing becomes cheaper and cheaper, the real cost of sequencing is more, less and less sequencing, but what you do with the data and how you prepare the data for sequencing. So this is a paper published about two years ago in genome biology, and the argument that the authors were doing was exactly this one. So before the next generation sequencing, about 1,000, most of the money was spent on sequencing. You had extracted DNA, you are sequencing, and that is the vast majority of the money was spent now, part of it is still sequencing, but you see the large fraction now is starting to be, in fact, the downstream analysis of the risk. And very soon, with the, the cheaper and cheaper sequencing that we have, very soon, most of the money and most of the investment will be on preparing the data and then analyzing the data. And this, in a sense, it's also very good news, because the sequencing in itself, it's quite boring. What you really would like to have is a system where most of your time and most of your money is invested on what are the interesting things, which are to think about experiments and to analyze this. 
And this sort of shifts the focus of biology and how we do research in biology from manipulating stuff to thinking about stuff. So, of course, being able to handle this data is going to be crucial to the biology. And the problem is that even though computers are faster and faster, if you compare the rate of acceleration of computer power with the rate of increasing the advance, computers are, from many points of view, getting slower and slower. So according to the Moore's law, the capacity of processing the computer doubles every 18 months. Uh, well, the size of the database is now doubling every nine months. So if your problem involves analyzing all the data, then computers are getting slower and slower. And this means that many of the ways that we could analyze data that might be called brute force methods, or just we already that thing should be doing like this, I'm not going to think very much about my analysis, I'm just going to do it. Uh, well, they will not work, because we need to think carefully about things like algorithms and how we do the analysis, because it's going to be more and more difficult if we want to take advantage of all the information. Of course, for many analyses, you don't need that much of information. And then it's fine. But if you really want to use all the information that's there, it's getting increasingly more difficult. And you really want to use the information. That's my, my, my point here. Is that sequencing, it used to be um, very much constrained to, to the analysis of genomes and uh, genetic information. And that nowadays, it's invading new fields. So it's invading ecology, for instance, microbial ecology, it's leading a revolution with metagenomics, which is now permitted by the fact that sequencing gets, is getting so cheap. Single cell genomics, which allow you to see differences between different cells, for instance, in the human body or in the community of microbes. RNA set, which allows you to grasp physiology, epigenetics, and so on. There are a whole bunch of different methods for sequencing that can provide a different set of samples and that will allow you to query biology or biological problem in different ways. So very soon we'll probably use sequencing for diagnostics of genetic diseases, infectious agents, and so on. Some hospitals are now in England are starting to get equipped with their next generation sequencing sequencers to have high throughputs of sequencing in the hospital just for uh, diagnosis. And then of course you have many data which is not Genetic. It's not genomic, it doesn't come from sequencing, but it's also getting increasingly um, abundant. For instance, imaging methods nowadays produce an, a vast amount of information and that is hard to, to, to grab if you don't really have the tools to, to analyze it in more form. And in a sense, it's changing our way of doing research. Because you used to think hard about problem, then you do an experiment, and then you analyze the data. Uh, and now, very often, people are just collecting the data at the beginning. And this sort of annoys uh, many biologists, because uh, you see, all the biology in the 20th century, or a part of it at least, was developed on, on the basis of a reaction against the 19th century biology, which was often seen as sort of a stamp collection of science. Right? So people would go into Amazonia and get all these bugs and all these birds and, and catalog them and so on. And in the 20th century, people wanted to do a more formal kind of science, more based on experiments or changing things. And so this sort of stamp collection biology became half fashionable. And my prediction is, in fact, that it will come back. It will come back with a revenge. In a sense that you will have, and we are now resisting this, some factors in the world that will produce a large amount of data sets that the other people will use for their research. And this is in fact what's happening today. If you have a few sequencing centers in the world, like the Broad Institute, Sanger Center, the Beijing Institute, they are producing a very, very large part of this genetic information that we use. And this in fact are factories. The researchers next to the factory, that the factory is the intellectual production of biology. And this leads me to my first prediction. So I have given some predictions because I think it's more fun. So in 20 years, you can see how many times I was wrong. Uh, and this is a paper that came out in Science a few years ago, two years ago, I think, uh, about data reuse. And this is a really important issue because um, if we're going to rely more and more on data that is being produced by other people, uh, well, then the data must be produced in a way that people are going to use it. And we must change the way we biologists think about, uh, about the way we do research 
in order to reuse the information that it's using. And the truth is that the vast amount, the vast majority of information that is produced by biologists in the world is simply thrown into the garbage whenever the paper comes out. So people will take the paper, but the information that is behind it is simply the world. And so this is sort of the point that people are doing with the science paper. And the question they used, the questions they put forward was, how often do you access or use data sets from the published literature for your original research papers? And so uh, most of the people said rarely. And from archival databases, most of the people said rarely. And this is sort of odd. I mean, we have millions of papers being produced in, the, in biology and biomedical sciences every year. And most of the information is not in the book. Of course, to use information and to be able to produce information in the way that can be used by others, it's not trivial. So my prediction is that biology, in a sense, will look like physics in 20 years. It's starting to look like physics now, but it will be much more like physics in 20 years. And what I mean by this, it's not so much that biology will be reduced to physics. I think in 20 years time we'll be very, very far away from that if that ever happens. Uh, what I mean is that in, in physics you have big factories of producing data, like the CERN and the, 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 the accelerated particle accelerators and so on. And you have theoretical physicists which sometimes are very far away geographically from these locations. And they're using the data. And people are producing data and people are testing theories and they're doing this more or less separately. The best typically are somewhere in between, between producing the data and making the <coughs> So this is <coughs> sort of the, the way I see the way we're going to do science. Uh, of course, I would like to talk a little bit also how I see it in my scientific field and the way we're going to um, advance in, in development of biology. So I sort of into that is uh, a lot of the science that's going to be done in biology is going to be observational science. And this has a very, very bad reputation among biologists. Um, because of this reaction to 19th century biology. So it's difficult to, to pass on the message that, in fact, the experimental method does not necessarily implicate effectively changing and perturbing an object and see what happens afterwards. Experimental biology, if you take a sort of a liberal expression, a liberal translation of Lugar now, um, a liberal is like not energy, uh, not, not today at least. But the observation can be experimental because the essence of experiment is not the manipulation of the objects, but it's rather sort of comparative judgment. And nobody would dare to think that people like astrophysicists are not scientists, right? But astrophysicists, they never perturb Jupiter to see what happens. Right? <laughs> and still, they have probably the best ability that we know of, of predicting what's going to happen in the future because they can predict the orbit of planets more very far away in the future with incredible precision. So you really do not necessarily need to perturb the system to learn something from it using the comparative method. And one point that is important to, to, to understand in terms of biology is that because there is so much diversity in biology, and most of which we don't know. In fact, we do not have either the money nor the people necessary to reproduce the experiments we've done in a few model organisms in all the organisms on Earth. So nowadays in, in, in microbiology, we know a few million species, a few hundreds of thousands of species, but we, we, we assume, and there is a good basis to think that we are right, we assume that we ignore more than 99.9% .9 of all the species that are there. Now, if you take E. coli, this is a paper, this is a graph I did a few, 10 years ago, but it's still quite relevant in quantitative terms. If you take E. coli, in 2000, there were 167 papers on E. coli. 167,000 papers. Now, this last time I checked, there were about 300,000 papers on E. coli. So, I mean, there is a lot of literature on E. coli. But if you consider that if you take a gram of soil, you get on average about 10 to the 6 different species of bacteria. You see that it's going to be really hard to produce 300,000 papers on every single species. So you have to somehow reason, reason by homology, reason by theoretical means to extract information on model organs towards models of organs to try not models. Because otherwise, we will not be able to do this. So my, graph, my two graphs read as follows. So this was done in 2000. At the time, we had about 15 bacterial genomes, which is sort of laughable in this age. 
Uh, and this genome is pretty human. So you have each region equal, equal line, which is very well known, microvacuum, tuberculosis, 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 very well known. You have rickettsia from the second, which we might not know. And pyrococcus or ecoshi, which I almost certainly have no, never heard of. And these 15 genomes have been sequenced, and you see that they have to find over 167,000 papers on E. coli, and 15 on amplified cell olecos, or 21 in pyrococcus or ecoshi. So, in some, some of these are widely studied, others are not safe at all. And this is true for every single domain environment. Now, what I'm representing here on the red graph is for the same organisms. Once we've sequenced the genome, how many genes could we predict, or how many genes could we predict the function? Of course, this is a critical function, as long as you do an experiment and so on. And some functions are more critical than others, meaning that we can assign probability and we can have a good idea if some predictions are more reliable than others. But what you see is that for pericocos or ecoshe, which of course is have nothing about, we have to see the same genome due to the function of all 16 other genes. So this is very important. It means that by using theoretical means, in this case by chromatic analysis, you can extract information that has been accumulated by more problems and extend it to the other ones. And this can accelerate very quickly your rhythm of research. Because, if, for instance, in something like the Paracopos Rikoshi, you have the basis of the metabolism, biomology, and then you can go to the things which are specific, which are peculiar to this bacteria, which are typically the ones of interest you. Nobody's going to study a real bacteria if you can study exactly the same mechanism in E. coli. It's much, much simpler. So my argument is that by using in biology and the sort of crafts work between data analysis and theory, in fact, you can use your computer as a lab in biology because the data is there and from the data you can formulate theories and because this is there and you have no bias in creating this data set, you can recruit the data as that And so in a silica lab can work perfectly well in biology. It will not solve all the questions, it will not put all the experimental biologists in employment, but it will give you a very interesting and complementary way of analyzing the biology. And the problem we have with bioinformatics, and it's five minutes on bioinformatics, comes more or less to this. So uh, I took my title and I translated it into uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. There's a lesson. <coughs> Um, and then what I did here is to put the first about two kilobases of the genome of a civil substance that we sequenced in 1997. Those are not the first multi genomes. Uh, and you see, it, it's sort of boring. Yeah, you have four letters, because I'm improving it. This is This is DNA. And the, the goal here is trying to understand what are the messages. How can you read this to infer certain, like, certain biological knowledge? from this set of authors. Of course, it helps a lot if you know the code. So if you know the code, you can take your title and you can give it the real title in English. The problem in DNA is it's much more complicated because you don't have one code. You have many codes. You have many separate codes. For instance, what I did in my sequence was to color it according to, to, to traits. Like, for instance, in the beginning, you have the orange replication of the chromosome. It's in orange. And then you have restriction sets scattered along the genome. This is in the You have in red promoters, which are implicated in transcription. The original replication is implicated in replication. Uh, Underlined is DNA boxes are regulatory regions associated with the start of replication. And you see that they're starting to overlap. So these nucleotides here, they are both part of the code of the main message associated with the code of transcription and the code of replication. And sometimes you can have three and four different processes that are going to interact with the DNA at the exact same place, which means that these sequences, these regions in the chromosome, will be under the, the, the constraint of different types of mechanisms. And what you would expect is that natural selection will select for a, an optimal interaction of the molecular mechanisms with the chromosome. But if you have different mechanisms interacting with the chromosome at the same time, you see, you have a complicated situation because you have multiple constraints that together will shape the way the bacteria, or the way the chromosome will develop. 
So here, for instance, I write out version for translation. Translation start, translation stop, and then I write the chain equation. And you see the same thing here. You have a regular provision for verification, regular provision for transcription. Now, the challenge here is to try to understand where is all the message for each code, and of course, to understand the different codes and how they interact. And the way they interact can tell you many things. For instance, if you have two different processes and one seems to overcome the other, in the sense that if there is a constraint on one process, it seems to be more important than the constraint on the other process. Well, that, that tells you something about what happens in the cell. What are the different processes, how they interact one with the others, and how they affect the fitness of the other. Of course, this is just by looking at the sequence. <coughs> But the, these sequences are generating other molecules, and these molecules will of course also have an impact. So some of the sequences will go, for instance, for an RNA molecular, which will have a secondary and tertiary structure, and this is also included in the sequence. And some will lead really to, 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 to the production of proteins, which are full in space, and they eventually interact with DNA and sort of making the loop in the system where you have constraints on the sequence that lead to protein structure which will interact with DNA and therefore constraint DNA at the same region or elsewhere in the region. And so my guess is that this problem, which is a very key problem in molecular genetics, that you have overlapping information, it's probably the hardest problem that you have to solve. How can you, by looking at sequences, infer and understand which are the mechanisms interacting with the DNA at the given location and what does this tell us about the physiology of the cell? What is this tell us about the evolution of the body? My particular bias is that evolution will have a key role on how we can understand this data. And this is because uh, evolution has a, a sort of formalism that bridges all biology, and it's quite strong. When you compare it with other domains in biology, it's highly metatized, it's in certain domains. And it allows you to, to, to understand how the different processes interact because if they interact in a positive way that it increases fitness, you can see it if you analyze it from an evolutionary point of view. So, for instance, this is the case of a gene which I have no clue what it does. I don't think it's a gene It's a gene in mammals. I haven't looked at mammals. But what's interesting is so you have an mRNA and you have exons, right? And this exists in humans, it's in a whole lot of, of mammals. And this is the tree linking, linking these species. And you see that if you compare the human gene with the given gene, they're essentially identical. Some regions have lower sequence identity, but overall, they're essentially identical. The divergence between the two polarisms, as the given side, is probably the same. As you go along the tree and you compare regions which are further and further off, from my point of view, you see that the similarity starts to fade away. And the way the similarity fades away tells us a lot of things. For instance, the exons, you can see that even when you're looking at cows, you can still see significant conservation of the sequence here. But in the introns, in the regions which are not leading to the protein, to the, to the protein sequence, it has almost disappeared, except that certain regions which probably have some regulatory role in the expression of the gene. Another point, which is now getting uh, uh, really important in biology is trying to integrate this information. Since you have massive information on genes, on expression, on some physiological traits, how can you integrate them together and have a view of how the cell works? Now, these are two radical different ways of representing the uh, It is not that one is right and the other is wrong. They are different. They tell us different things and they help us differently to, to understand biology. So this is quite handy. If you just want to draw it in the blackboard, in the lab, I mean, this is much easier than this, right? So for many of the ideas that you want to put forward, this is way done. But of course, it's very far from reality, much further off from reality than this. Here you see, you can understand that the DNA, in fact, if you stretch it up, it will be much, much, much larger than the bacterial cell. So it has to be folded. And it is folded by the interaction of the number of proteins. And of course, in the bacterial cell, there is no, no compartmentalization inside the cell. And therefore, you have RNA polymerases, transcribing genes, and then you have ribosomes that stop these genes which are being uh, translated into proteins. The proteins start to get to localized in different parts of the cell before the end of the 
through all these things they point at the same time. This image, of course, does not allow you at all to understand this, and this one starts to do the work. So what you would like, in fact, is to, to shift in terms of models, from very simple models to very complicated models, depending on what you want to do and what the conclusions you want to do. It is not necessarily the case that the complicated model is better than a simple model, because a simple model allows you to abstract from things which are not very relevant for what's interesting. So the integration of the systems, it's going to be really a very hot topic in the last, in the next decade, I think. It's starting to become more. And, and it is this need that we now um, feel that for a long time in biology, we have been trying to reduce the problem to simple basis. And now we realize that that's not enough. We have to start integrating it. It is not that reducing is necessarily wrong. You have to you want to understand that and you have to try simple things. But if you really want to understand the whole, well, you have to put it in the sense of single things, simple things together with what they are, which is a complicated thing. So systems biology is quite, quite uh, um, I have a topic these days. It involves more things than people often think about. It is not just doing physics models and putting it in front of biological data. It's much more complicated than that because you have to use different types of information, some of which is not quantitative, might be qualitative, some which might be ordinal. There are different types of information here. You have to handle it in a significant way. And this is a, a, an entire domain of research that is still being explored in biology. It would be really important. So what about the future? Uh, so my prediction, and I think I'm quite right on this one, it's that by in 20 years' time, no one will talk about micronomics. So I probably would be in ridicule, we'll see in 20 years' time. But this is a graph that, that, that I did inspired on a paper by this person a few years ago. So there is this thing in Google, which is called Google Trends. I don't know if you use it, it's a fun gadget. You put words there and it tells you if it's trendy or it's not trendy. So you might be happy about it, depending on what you look for. to be trendy about. Uh, and this is for bioinformatics. And it tells you basically how often is, uh, was bioinformatics hot in different times in the last 10 years. And you see, bioinformatics 10 years ago was really hot. And nowadays, it's quite cool in the sense that uh, you see it doesn't happen very much. It doesn't appear very much. You don't see it in the newspapers. Uh, and it seems that it's dead. On the other hand, I did another analysis, which I did the Web of Science, and for each year from 2002 to 2011, I took the 10 papers that were more cited in that year, that in 2012 had accumulated the largest citations in that year. Right? So I took the 10 papers of 2002 that were more, more cited in a cumulative way until 2012. Okay? And then I did the same for 2003, 2004, etc. So basically, I took all the domains of research together which makes about 15 million, 15 million papers a year, right? All the names together. And I wonder where in the rank is the first bioinformatics paper? And so in 2002, the second most cited paper is a bioinformatics paper. In 2003, it's the first. In 2004, it's the third. In 2005, it's the second. In 2006, and so on. In 2011, it was the first. So systematically, the most cited papers in the scientific literature are bioinformatics papers. And this is sort of weird, right? It's not trendy, but everybody is cycling it. And I think what's happening in bioinformatics is very close to what's happening before. And it's happening now in molecular biology, which is almost no one anymore says, well, I am a molecular biologist. How many of you, when you present yourself to your friends or to colleagues, would say, I am a molecular biologist these days? Practically no one. But 20 years ago, many people would do that. It was very trendy to be a molecular biologist. And the same thing is happening in bioinformatics. It doesn't make much more any sense to say I'm a bioinformatician, or it still makes some sense, but in 10 years it won't, because most of us will be a bioinformatician in a, in a certain sense. And so that's my final prediction. We will all be part of bioinformatics in the end, and bioinformaticians. And we will all need to have this idea that we have to handle with data, and the data we're going to have to handle it's going to be more and more abundant. We're going to have more and more different types of data. We're going to have to integrate this data. And this leads to notions of computer science, integrating data in computer science, or dealing with this data, which can be statistics, but can also be computer science. 
there are ways of computing in statistics. And of course, it also involves modeling, which typically is something that's well done by physicists, where you, you, you try to build models with different levels of granularity to give you some expectation of what you expect, and then you go back to confront the data with that expectation. Now, this does not mean that metabiology, that the, the experimental biology, the classical experimental biology, which is in the, in the wet lab, is going to disappear. Of course not. Uh, but it means that everyone will have to be possibly a little bit experimental biologist, a little bit biomedician. Maybe some will only be biomedicians, some will only be experimental biologists. But very few will be able to ignore 